أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيد الممجد بشير المصدق المصطفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعن الله ولا الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولما جاءهم كتاب من عند الله مصدق لما معهم وكانوا من قبل يستفتحون على الذين كفروا فلما جاءهم ما عرفوا كفروا به فلعنة الله على الكافرين صدق الله العلي العظيم A way to Savior of Humanity, Imam Al-Mahdi alayhi salam. My respect to teachers, elders, brothers and sisters. Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum Having spoken about the Jewish community in Medina and how they were awaiting the Prophet and when he came, ma arafu kafaru bih, that they neither recognized him, accepted him, they also belied him and rejected him. And so the lesson for you and I being that when our Imam comes, we do not fall into the same trap. And so we spoke about Ma'rifa and that Ma'rifa really means that I walk the path of the Imam and by virtue of sharing in the same struggles that he undertakes, I am given a glimpse of the reality of this individual. And yesterday we continued our discussion of Ma'rifa but from a different angle. And we stated that we want to understand the Imam of our time in light of our time. And we need to understand him in light of his universalization and the global goals that he seeks to obtain. In that, he is not an Imam for the Shia. He is not an Imam for the Muslims. He is not an Imam for the monotheists. Rather, he is an Imam for every person within this world irrespective of your faith or creed, location or gender. And so we have to understand him in light of the world that we see today. I have to understand my Imam in light of modern Mexico or in light of modern Bolivia or in light of modern North Korea. And when I see the Imam and his ultimate task and goals in light of this world, I will really have a true cognizance, ma'rifa, of what this individual's tasks are at hand and the things that he has to achieve in order to bring each state, each global community to a point of their own self-completion. And so we talked about this from the Qur'an and we pick up from where we left off yesterday. And we mentioned many verses, two of them in particular. One describes the Meccan community that Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam came to. And that is, فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِئَ النَّفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ Nope, sorry, my apologies, that is a different verse. فَلَعَمْرُكَ إِنَّهُمْ لَفِي سَكْرَتِهِمْ يَعْمَهُونَ I take an oath by your existence, Ya Rasulullah. Surely these people are wandering blindly in their intoxication. At one point they were down here in their morality, in their constitution, everything that they were enacting in their society. Yet, after just a handful of years, Rasulullah elevated the same community to a point whereby Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could reveal a new verse saying, Kuntum khayran ummatan ukhrijat linnas you are the best of people amongst the whole of mankind. How Rasulullah took them from down here to up here within the space of just a, sh a few short years. Here we need to continue this. There is a narration which speaks about Kuntum khayran ummatan ukhrijat linnas. And as we go into this, we will see more 
about what the awaited Savior is tasked with and having cognizance of his global responsibilities. There is a narration that says that there was a small battle, not one of the major battles that took place, but there was a smaller battle that Rasulullah partook in and had undertaken. Now the Quraysh community had certain laws that they abided by and one of them was that whenever there was a battle because we're talking about the Arabian heat and the desert circumstance the difficulty of battle there was always a water boy and that when someone was struck down on the battlefield and thus lying in the final moments of their life in the pangs and sways of death there was always freedom for a water boy to come and give that stricken individual water before he died and so the rule the convention amongst the Arabs was that both the stricken individual was given safety and protection unless he desired to be killed and secondly that the water boy, young and defenseless, was allowed freedom to go from person to person to be able to quench their thirst before they passed away from this world. And so in one of these battles, Rasulullah, or rather in one of these battles, there was an incident that took place. Now yesterday you will recall that when we talked about the Quraysh community, we spoke about what level they were at. We said that when they would cross each other in the streets if there was a just a bad look between each other they would go to war to the extent their tribes would go to war for so long after generation to generation they forgot what they were going to war about and so this is what the community was like keep this in mind the incident says that when the war took place three of the Muslim members of the army were struck down very quickly one after another lying stricken on the battlefield and so the water boy ran from the tent with his flask and he arrived at the first individual lying on the battlefield he was about to pour him that water in order to quench his thirst before he passes the first individual says don't give water to me there is another individual, another Muslim on the battlefield who has also been struck down. He is also in a state of death. I cannot bear to have my thirst quenched whilst he is in need of water. Go to him first. And so the water boy ran from the first to the second man. And he comes to the second individual and the second individual is offered the glass of water and he responds with the same thing. He says, I don't want a glass of water. Please give it to the third man who is struck in the battlefield. I cannot bear that I am quenched whilst he dies thirsty. And so the water boy ran from the second Muslim to the third Muslim. And the third Muslim was offered water. And he says, please do not give me water. I cannot bear that my thirst is quenched while the first individual lies thirsty. Go to him first. And so the water boy runs from the first to the second, second to the third and the third tells him to go back to the first. When he runs to the first, what does he find? The first has already passed away from this world in a state of thirst. And so he leaves and he runs to the second individual, the one he tried to give water to. When he runs to that second individual, he finds that that individual has also died in a state of thirst. His thirst wasn't quenched. And so he runs to the third, and the third, he is also passed away without having his water given to him. You see, each and every one of these individuals preferred to die thirsty than allow their brother to die thirsty. They preferred to die thirsty so long as their individual friend was given water first. Think about this, Rasulullah came to a community that had so many tribal wars that they used to go to war for so much that they instituted four months of the year whereby fighting was haram, correct? 
Muharram, for example, fighting was haram. He came to a community that hated each other so much that if you glanced at someone in the wrong direction, they would go to war for generation after generation to the point that they had forgotten what they had gone to war about. After a few years with them, these same people who had been enemies of each other, these tribal people who had hated each other so much, they were willing to die thirsty for the sake of one another. This is what Rasulullah had done to them. He had instituted that humanity from within them. As we stated yesterday, Rasulullah's context in which he primarily served as a prophet was to the Arab pagan community. Whereas Mahdi has to do the same thing at a global level. It is like me saying today when he comes, he will remove the animosity between the Basque separatist movement ETA and the Spanish government. He will learn and to reconcile them. It is like me saying that those Catholics and Protestants that have gone to war for centuries, especially in the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, Mahdi sallamullahi alayhi will bring peace, love between them to the extent that they would rather die thirsty than the Catholic die thirsty or the Protestant die thirsty. It is like me saying that those individuals that actually bomb other Muslims, he will bring them to a point of loving each other. This is what he is going to do at a global level. Now think about it. Well, actually, if he tried to bring uh, Democrats and Republicans together, that would probably be a bridge too far for him. Maybe he wouldn't be able to bridge that gap, right? <laughs> no, we've said that those Muslims that are killing Muslims today, his job would be to re-inspire them back towards faith. There is no difference between the Wahhabi community essentially and those pagans 1400 years ago. They were tribal people. They went to war with each other for the sake of pettiness. They were willing to take a life of each other for the sake of pettiness. If Rasulullah can help overcome that mentality, surely Mahdi sallallahu alayhi will be able to change the Wahhabi mentality. Now we will talk about this in further detail later on actually. But the point I actually make is that we need to understand what this man is about. He is about resolving world crises. He is about bringing reformation within community. He is about removing hunger and poverty. He is about removing lack of education and disease within the community. How have I conceptualized Mahdi sallallahu alayhi? Am I still thinking that when he comes, he's going to remove the petty differences that we have within our community? That he's going to talk to us about taqlid and marja'iyya? Is he going to tell us, you know, that these, these petty things about moon sighting? How is he going to deal with us? We have to realize the level that this man is trying to bring what he is trying to get us to and so long as we do not understand this we will never truly have ma'rif of him and his mission he has to be understood in a global context now working off we, what we said yesterday we asked a question and we said that is are all these countries the same if you look at Pakistan the mentality the culture the strengths, the weaknesses, are they the same as, for example, Canada? Is Canada the same, for example, as Venezuela? Is Venezuela the same as Cambodia? The same as Burkina Faso? It can't be, can it? Each of those cultures, each of those mentalities, each of their politics, their economics are in flux. They are all relative to each other. When Rasulullah came, he primarily came to one group of individuals, an Arab community. Their trade was very similar, their politics was very similar, and so although we had Christians and Mus uh, Jews and Zoroastrians and Muslims, they had primarily lived under one culture. And so he had to elevate them, he had to elevate them under one 
culture, when the awaited Savior comes and he first tries to liberate one country and this arrives at its peak, they will already be practicing certain things. Maybe if he comes to Iran or he comes to Iraq or he comes to Syria, there will already be an Islam that they are practicing. If he comes to China or if he comes to North Korea, will they already be practicing Islam? Likeliness not. When he comes to Cambodia or he comes to Venezuela, will they be practicing Islam? Likely not. And so the way in which he has to deal with people will also be very relative. It is not one world. It is a world made up of its own paradigm. They are not the same. You cannot deal with Iran, who has had 30 years of an Islamic revolution under Imam al-Khomeini, under Sayyid Khamenei, Dama Tawfiqahu, the same as Mexicans. They're not at the same wavelength. They don't have the same understanding. They don't have the same culture. And as such, the way in which you revive that community and the way in which you bring them to their own foreign completion cannot be the same. Tell me, does a father deal with two children in his own house the same? Why not? Many people here are parents. Do you deal with one child the same as the other? Why not? Because you recognize they are individuals. You recognize that their environment has molded them slightly differently. They think slightly differently. They respond slightly differently. You will ask one to get ready for mosque and he will run to put on his shoes. You ask the other and he will throw a tantrum. True or not? But you will say, I'm the same father. I'm the same mother. The reality is every point of their life was unique and so they are unique how can this world be the same when the entirety of the world is so unique in its thought process and so we have to continue to understand him how will he deal with this world how will he deal with mexico can he impose the same sharia upon mexico today as to what he would do to Iran today? It makes us think, doesn't it? I ask you a question. It's just to open your minds. If Mahdi would not impose the same Sharia upon Iran as to why he would upon Mexico, why do I think there should be the same Sharia for me here as to what there should be in Iraq? You see, when you think about modernity, when you think about the reality of this world today, you come to certain obvious conclusions. Now here I'm not espousing a relative fiqh, I'm asking you to think about how Mahdi will be. How do you think he will be? Because the majority of us haven't thought about it. The majority of us have limited him to a very Khoja based context or a very Arab 7th century based context the reality is he is coming to neither of those and we have to understand this before we can move forward there are certain suppositions that we must have within our mind now as we continue this and break further into these concepts let us go deeper. Rasulullah came to a certain type of community. Let us pick a couple of challenges and try to understand them and see the relative challenge that the awaited Savior would have if he were to come today. Let us pick two. For example, the women of Arabia and the slave stroke black community of Arabia. When Rasulullah came, may God's peace and blessings be upon his family, he had to deal with a community that buried their daughters alive. 
a community that did not educate their women, a community that actually felt women were property, and so you could inherit them, or you could sell them off. Correct or not? Based upon that, we have that very famous tradition from the Holy Prophet that says, when you get married, teach your wives basic accountancy, right? Teach them hisab, mathematics, the ability to count. Why did Rasulullah tell his community, teach them basic mathematics? One, because clearly they didn't even have that level of education. Number two, as a woman who is bringing up children into the house, if she is uneducated, then by and large, as the primary caregiver, the children will also be uneducated. Three, as for us, a woman who primarily is the bedrock of the family and buys and looks after things, deals with the banks, deals with everything, if that person cannot count, it is a worry to ask someone to spend when they don't know what money is and how much they have in the account. Because, obviously, you will run into bankruptcy. And so at all levels, Rasulullah had to institute the most basic, basic human concept and say, teach your women to read and write. Now that community found it new. It was audacious. What do you mean, teach women to read and write? It was new for them. And so, based upon this, Rasulullah came to a given context. He had to come and liberate women based upon their current circumstance. Correct or not? Now, if Mahdi was to come today, and he had to also liberate women from their given context. Would he say the same thing that Rasulullah said or not? Help me out here. Would he say the same thing that Rasulullah said? Would he say, teach your women how to read and write? Of course he wouldn't. Of course he wouldn't. Right now, Brazil, the president is a woman. Wilma Rousseff. Right now, the most powerful economy in Europe, and also the best football team in the world, Germany, yes, is run by a woman. Chancellor Angela Merkel. Right now, if you look at this world today in the United States of America, the probability is again, unless you're a Republican, the probability is that your next president will be a woman. Who is going to be the Democratic Party nomination? Hillary Clinton. So now possibility, the possibility or even probability, I'm not a fan of Mitt Romney, so I'm going to not support that any statement, but based upon that, the probability is that the most, and I understand Mahdi Salaamullahi Alayhi is the most powerful man in the world, but just bear me out. The most powerful woman in America or in the world would be a woman. The most powerful person in Europe is a woman. The world has moved on. We are not in a 7th century paradigm. Why do we think in 7th century Arab paradigms? Can you see that? If Mahdi was to come today and he had to liberate women from their given context, he would not be asking us to educate. By God, they're already more educated than we are. He would not be saying, allow them to come and have the world of work. You know, if you look at this world today and you take the Forbes list of the richest 500 people in the world, See how many women there are, right? They are part and parcel of this world's economy, part and parcel of this world's politics, part and parcel of this world's education system. There are more teachers, there are more female teachers 
in the global system by 70% than what there are men. Yet, when we read our narrations, the narration tell us certain things about the way in which we are supposed to think about women. Women's intellects are deficient, apparently. That we cannot have women in leadership. That we cannot have women as educators and teachers above men. Yet the world today has arrived at a point where the most powerful woman in the world tomorrow will be a woman. The most powerful person in Europe today is a woman. I ask you, how will Mahdi sallallahu alayhi deal with this issue in the 21st century? Will he bring it back to what Rasulullah wanted? Will he say, I'm sorry, women can't be in leadership? Will he remove women from leadership? Will he remove women as teachers and primary educators and tell them that their role is primarily to be within the house and go back to teaching them and how to educate them in reading and writing? It can't be. It cannot be. And so we need to think. We really need to start educating ourselves on the reality of what Islam is in the 21st century. Let me give you another context to understand the reality of this world. When Rasulullah came, he had to liberate slaves, correct or not? The slave community en masse, by and large, were blacks. Yes, they had been shipped in from certain parts of the world, be it Africa or parts of Yemen and so on and so forth. They were uneducated. They did not have rights, correct or not? They could be sold as property. Do you know what the Qur'an says? The Qur'an says, do not prostitute out your slaves. Why? Because that's what they were doing. That's the way in which the Arab community treated their slave trade. Now, I recognize that in certain parts of the world, slavery still exists. It exists in Saudi Arabia. It exists in Yemen. It exists in certain parts of the Far East. However, by and large, mankind has elevated itself to a point whereby it removed, it removed slavery, correct or not? When Rasulullah came, he had to bring them certain basic notions. Instead of having slaves that could not read and write, teach them to read and write. What you should end up trying to do is free your slaves so that they have certain freedoms rather than being primarily part of the economic system. True or not? He said, don't prostitute out your slaves. You do not have the right to do this. He got it to a point whereby he said that what you wear should be the same clothes as what your slaves wear. And they followed suit. He said, the same food you eat, they should eat. And the Quraysh community followed suit. Now those were new ideas to them. This is something that they had never heard. And so, if Mahdi was to come today, and he had to look back at what Rasulullah did, and he broke the racism, like Rasulullah, we would say to you, Mahdi, we have already broken racism. We have a black president as the head of the world's most powerful country. You don't need to come and tell us to break slavery. We've already done it. And so, what will Mahdi sallallahu alayhi come to teach us? Think about this. If he comes today, is he going to go outside and look at our traffic system and say, you know what, I don't like the fact that you have these three colors, and so I want you to change. Will he say, I don't like that you have so many traffic lights, change to roundabouts. What will he come and do? How will he come and bring about a revolution? Rasulullah started in Mecca. I ask you a question. If the awaited savior was to come today and to start his revolution in New York, where would he start? How would he bring about a change in New York, which eventually was to reverberate around the whole of the world? What would he do? 
You see, if we have not got an answer to this, if we don't even have an answer to this, then we don't truly have ma'rifah of him or what he's going to do. And so when he comes and establishes his revolution, I will not be able to recognize him or what he is doing because I've never even understood the way in which his methodology is. No wonder the Jewish community rejected Rasulullah. No wonder Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ma arafu kafaru bi. You did not have ma'rif of him. And as such, when he came to do his mission, you rejected him. It requires us to think about the awaited Savior in a given context. And so we have to understand his morality in light of the morality of today. We have to understand his jurisprudence in light of the jurisprudence of today. We have to think of tafsir in light of the tafsir of today. We are not in a 7th century Bedouin context. And so we see this around the world. We see right now in the Central African Republic, CAR, we see Christians burning Muslims alive and then eating their flesh using cannibalism. We see today Wahhabis, ISIS, Salafis. Do you know what they do? They come and they put bombs strapped to cats and they let the cat wander into a given street and then explode the cat. They strap bombs onto people who are in wheelchairs and then a second bomb. When the first bomb goes off, they let the crowd come to try to pick up the wounded and the dead and then they set off a second bomb. This is the world that Mahdi Alaihi will come to. Think about it. How will he deal with such people? How will he deal with New York? How will he deal with Cambodia? How will he deal with New Zealand? How will he deal with Palestine? And so this is the world that we need to contextualize the Imam into. Because the moment I've understood him and his mission, I will understand what my role is in regards to that mission as well. If Rasulullah liberated women in accordance to that given context, then I would know that Mahdi will liberate women in accordance with their own context. And so I realize what my responsibilities are to the women of the community. If I realize Rasulullah came to the black community and brought them to a point of their own foreign completion and I see that Mahdi would do the same thing but relative to his time I now understand what my tasks are relative to my time. And so all of this has a very big point of unison between themselves. It goes from Rasulullah to Imam to Imam to our Imam. And then there is the longevity of Ghayba. And so we must ask ourselves, and this is the topic for the next five nights coming, the next two questions. Number one, what does he do in his Ghayba? What do I think he does in his Ghayba? Does he just go from ziyara to ziyara to ziyara to ziyara? Does he just sit on his musalla the whole day doing tasbihat and reciting Quran? Tangibly, what is it that he is doing in this period of Ghayba? Number one. And number two, what is the benefit to you and I in terms of having this 1200 year Ghayba? How does it help the Muslim context? How does it aid those people in New Zealand? How does it aid people in North Korea? in order to welcome the awaited Saviour. And so, I leave you with these kinds of questions for you and I to ponder upon overnight, so that as we come to the discussions, we have already brought some of our thought processes to it. And so, inshallah, in the next few nights, this will be our topic, in order to have ma'rifah of the Imam of our time. Walhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. 
وصلى اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين. Please raise your hands and join me in du'a. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the reappearance of the awaited Savior, to allow us to be alongside him at all times in our life and in our death. If we are to pass away from this world before his coming, to raise us from our graves so that we may partake in the victory of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. We ask you, Allah, there are many people around the world going through such desperate times. Those people are in a state of war and oppression. Those people are in a state of poverty and lack of education, disease and natural disaster. Ya Allah, Grant them all safety and security for the sake of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad and allow us to perform the ziyara of the Imam of our time. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Can I ask you to recite a loud salawat in honor of the awaited Savior of our time, the Master and Lord of our age, the Prince of Justice, Imam al Mahdi, Ajjalallahu ta'ala faraj al Sharif. <laughs>